welcome to Sassy Mama's expert chat on breastfeeding. I'm Kristen, the marketing manager at Sassy Mama, and today I'm here with Dr. Trisha from Osler Health International. Today we are excited to talk about everything you wanted to know about breastfeeding, but we're afraid to ask. From the benefits of breastfeeding, positions and latch, common concerns, maternal self-care, and so much more. Before I turn it over to Dr. Trisha, I want to to take a moment to remind everyone to put yourselves on mute so we can clearly hear our speaker. Feel free to keep your cameras on. We love to see your faces. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions. If you have any, you can submit them by privately messaging me and the Zoom chat function throughout the presentation. And I will read them out loud at the end of the presentation for Dr. Trisha to answer. All questions will be anonymous. Thanks so much. Dr. Trisha, over to you to introduce yourself and kick us off. Thank you, thank you so much, Kristen, um, and thanks to Sassy Mama and to everyone who's joined on this um, call and little session that we have. Um, I'm Trisha. I'm one of the doctors at Oslo Health International. Um, we're a group of um, GPs, um, sort of family physicians, essentially, um, and you know we look after pretty much you know from newborns till the older age range as well. So we do manage a lot of conditions. Um, and today, uh, thanks to Sassy Mama, you know I've been um, given this opportunity to talk about something I'm really passionate about. Um, love be, being involved in women's health and especially, you know, for breastfeeding, it's such a large chunk of maternal well-being and maternal health. So um, very, very happy to be here to be talking about this. Um, so what we'll talk about today is, um, as Kristen mentioned, so we're going to talk about why breastfeeding and um, why it is so ideal for both mum and baby, um, what you can be doing to setting yourself up for success um, or as much as you can in your journey of breastfeeding. Um, and of course, there's so much we can talk about in breastfeeding, but we're going to focus, at least in this talk, a little bit more on the early days and sort of early weeks and what you can expect, um, common problems that arise and what we can be doing to help, to help you through those. And finally, of course, any talk related to maternal health, I think, is complete, is incomplete without really looking after mom's full well-being. Um, and we're going to be touching a little bit on that as well. So why breastfeeding? Um, I'm sure all of you have heard breast is best and, you know, all such things. So, um, but we're just going to try and break it down a little bit. So we're going to talk first about why is breastfeeding really good for babies, and then also look at why it's beneficial for mums as well. Um, so for breastfeeding for babies, you know, it really is the ideal nutrition for your baby, and it's made specifically for your baby. Breast milk is enough, sort of, it's all that your baby needs in the first six months of life, and even as you introduce solids, it continues to be that primary source of nutrition that your babies rely on. Breast milk in itself has so many bioactive substances. You know, it helps to protect your baby from infections, but it also helps in maturing their organs, things like the brain, their bone marrow, um, helps to maintain this really healthy gut microbiome as well. Um, so just overall very, very good. And breast milk in itself, actually, you know, unlike formula, it tends to change and fine tune itself according to what your baby needs. Um, as your baby gets older, the calorie content of the breast milk increases, which is why, um, you know, if you are expressing breast milk and you're giving it by a bottle, you'll notice that your baby continues to take that 60, 90 mils, um, 100 mils max, you know, for the longest ever time. And that volume doesn't tend to change, unlike formula milk itself. Of course, in the short term, breastfed babies, you know, breast milk protects your babies from getting sick. It's, uh, breastfed babies tend to require less medications, require less hospital admissions. But even in the longer run of things, it really reduces the risk of so many other childhood health issues, things like asthma, eczema, upper and lower respiratory tract infections, you know, ear infections and things like that, um, childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, and even things like childhood leukemia and breast milk has been shown to be very beneficial and a protective factor against that. Um, the other thing breast milk is, especially with um, children, you know, we hear a lot about the sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, and breast milk in itself is actually a protective factor against SIDS. So again, 
one of the very many benefits for babies from breast milk. And more than just being nutrition, breast milk is very much, you know, provide, it, it provides comfort, provides security to your baby, you know, helps babies to sleep, and especially when they're sick, provides them, sort of relieves them of that distress. Um, now, in terms for mums, of course, it has many health benefits as well. Um, you know, firstly, it reduces the risk of certain cancers, especially breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and even endometrial cancer. Health-wise, has a great benefit in lowering your risk of developing type 2 diabetes, developing high cholesterol, and has a protective effect towards your cardiovascular, towards your heart health. And actually, contrary to what many people believe, you know, although breastfeeding is really hard, it is really difficult and does take a you know, physical, mental, emotional toll on a lot of mums, but actually breastfeeding, and as long as you support it well with it, tends to reduce the risk of postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, you know, many people feel, and sometimes they're misled by loved ones and you know, by family members who obviously see how difficult this is for you. And you know, sometimes even some healthcare professionals might believe that if you stop breastfeeding, your problems off in that it in you in that uh, you know, immediate post um, part of state will resolve. But actually what studies have found is that mums who end up not quite breastfeeding or, you know, stopping abruptly or stopping earlier than they expected, they actually tend to fare worse on their mental health. So, um, you know, it really is about kind of looking after the mum holistically and, and your baby holistically rather than just blaming things on how the difficulty of breastfeeding. And of course, apart from just health wise, we're also looking at it. Obviously, breastfeeding is not free. Um, it requires a lot, a lot, a lot of effort, a lot of time spent um, on, on making this work. But it does tend to help in reducing healthcare costs. You know, kids get sick less. If you're returning back to work, you miss work less. Um, and of course, the need for formula products as well. It has a good effect for our environment as well. Um, so next couple of slides are really talking about, you know, what can we be doing to setting ourselves up for success for breastfeeding? So if you're already breastfeeding, you know, maybe ignore this part, but if you're, um, you're, you're pregnant, you're going to give birth soon. So really the, the main thing that is all about breastfeeding is really support and just making sure you have plenty of support, not just at home, but, you know, have an outside village of support as well. And um, a lot of mums, especially new mums or mums who've had difficulty and challenges with breastfeeding before, tend to find learning about breastfeeding during the pregnancy very useful and very helpful in, in, in just kind of understanding what needs to be done and, and what's kind of the preparation that needs to be done. In terms of the medical healthcare side of things, um, you know, we, we can see, we, we tend to see women for sort of a bit of prenatal counseling and your, you know, your obstetricians, your um, lactation consultants, midwives can do this as well. And, it's really looking at um, women who may be having difficulties during pregnancy. So if you've got really like painful breast growth, um, again, challenges before in your prior um, breastfeeding experiences. If you've got any medical history where, which, you know, we need to think about if you're on certain medications that may interfere with breastfeeding or you're concerned about it. Um, and also if you've had any kind of breast surgery in the past, you know, be it a medically indicated reason or for cosmetic reasons as well, all of those can have an effect and kind of an impact on how your breastfeeding journey goes. So really talking that through and, and really discussing that even prior to starting breastfeeding. And um, what we should really be thinking about is of course that nipple and breast care. So again, that's sort of the prenatal counseling that a lot of, um, you know, uh, lactation consultants, midwives do as they tend to do as well. And so do, so do we as GPs. Um, and really understanding what breastfeeding entails, what it's all about. And, and, and finding out what does it mean to express breast milk. Um, and when we're speaking about that, you know, harvesting cholesterol is one of those things that's really taking, um, you know, a lot of women are, are interested in that. And it's especially useful for women we may think might be at a risk of having low milk supply after their baby comes, or may have had issues with low milk supply or other challenges in their other, uh, with their other babies. Um, so cholesterol is essentially that kind of early milk you know you, many women start to notice it from like second or third trimester onwards sort of that yellow clear color um, full of really really good nutritious stuff but expressing cholesterol does tend to help women especially with if they've had low milk supply issues in the past and learning that technique even if you've not had any issues can be very useful in the initial few days after birth um, you know if your baby's unable to latch but you're, you know that the sort of the way of how to hand express 
getting that cholesterol out. If you've got cholesterol already stored and frozen before your delivery, giving that to your newborn as they're, you know, getting that kind of um, latch and position and things developed on. Um, and finally, you know, a lot of things is about, uh, most of us in Singapore do tend to give birth at a hospital. So it's really thinking about what you need to be taking to the hospital with you, um, you know, um, comfortable, comfortable clothes, um, comfortable sort of bras, uh, you know, any organic nipple balms, things like that. Um, and really while you're in hospital, really making use of those lactation consultants in hospital um, and, and having your pump there with you, making sure you're, even if you may never use your pump, but just making sure you're doing all the right stuff. So getting your um, flanges fitted very well um, and just understanding how the whole pumping system works as well. Because um, for a newbie, it is a total, um, most people want to be know what to do with it. Okay, um, so that's sort of more on the, the parent side of things. Um, so you've given birth, you've had your baby, and this the whole journey now starts. Okay, so the, the World Health Organization recommends immediate skin to skin contact immediately after birth. And what that means is a bare baby is laid against mom's bare chest as soon as possible after birth. And this can be done even for C-section women as well, especially as their wound is being sort of stitched up, okay? What we see is with the skin to skin contact, it really helps to regulate the temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, the breathing rate for both mom and baby. And for mom especially, it also helps in reducing the amount of blood loss as well um, post delivery. So that's something really, really important. And throughout your breastfeeding journey, skin to skin contact, especially in the early weeks, is really, really crucial just to build up that supply, get your baby used to you, get yourself used to your baby, and, and, and setting that up. Um, over the next few days, um, once you just, many, most of us will be discharged from hospital, you know, a day or two after delivery. You come home, you know, your initial latch was great. But now the milk is starting to come in, okay? The breast is starting to feel fuller, more engorged, um, just feels a bit lot more heavier and swollen. And this is when you might start noticing that your infant, your, your baby starting to have struggle with latching on. Because you can imagine this really large, you know, firm breast and baby's just not able to latch onto the nipple very well. And this is the time when, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about this, things are not quite settling down with a simple, um, techniques, then it's really about making sure you're getting help early. You're reaching out to a lactation consultant, back to your obstetrician, a pediatrician if you're seeing them for, you know, a weight check-in or something or the other. Um, and, and, you know, as much as we, um, you know, in the early days, the other thing that's really we need to be looking at is sort of position and latch. And, Everyone focuses on this amazing latch when the baby opens their mouth really wide, they have to come to the breast, but until you have a really good position, there can be no comfortable latch. So these positions, you know, we talk about them and they're there as for us to understand the, the ways we can breastfeed. You don't have to follow typically anything by the, by the book, um, but essentially, you know, the laid back and sideline position tend to help women, especially in the early few days when you've got a lot of breast engorgement and things. Um, and, 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 you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about all of these positions. So laid back essentially is very much what it looks like. Mom is lying back, uh, baby is on, on her chest and being supported by her body. Um, the cradle position is essentially, you know, you're cradling your baby. So, you know, you've got the baby on the left breast, your left arm is supporting your baby with your left hand under the baby's bum. Okay, um, the football hold is not quite clear in the picture, but essentially, instead of the baby lying across your lap, which they would be doing in the cradle and the cross cradle, what happens in football hold is the baby's lying alongside you. So their arms, their legs are essentially tucked inside the mom's arm, and their head is supported by the same side hand that the baby's on. So if the baby's on the left breast, the left hand is supporting their, their neck and, and, and head essentially. Um, the cross cradle is very much like the cradle, but essentially it's the opposite breast and the opposite hand. So baby is on the left breast and then it's your right arm and hand that's supporting the baby's body and neck. Sideline is essentially that. It is just lying on both of your sides. So if you're feeding from the left breast, you're lying on the left side and your right arm is supporting the baby. Um, and again, sideline and laid back, they're both very good positions, um, especially for sideline. You know, if you've got larger breasts, or if you've got a very fast, heavy letdown, 
that tends to help um, the babies to latch better and to drink and extract milk better as well. Um, so what's really important in the early days is again, just kind of understanding, you know, breastfeeding is a learning curve for both mom and baby. So it's very much, you're learning about your baby, your baby is learning the skill of breastfeeding as well. Um, and what's important for us to realize is to see how they're, what the feeding cues are. Newborns will want to feed often and several times during a day. So there's, if you're exclusively breastfeeding, it's going to be a minimum of 10 to 12 times in the 24 hour period of when they will be feeding. Typical cues tend to be, you know, this kind of smacking of lips, they're turning their cheek, especially if you, with any kind of movement, mouthing their hands. Um, and if a baby is really frantic, they're crying, that's quite a late sign of baby wanting a feed. Um, and so it can get really quite stressful. So it's, instead of just, you know, trying to get them to the breast, the, you should try to just somehow calm them down a little bit before you bring them to the breast, okay? The other thing, especially in the early days, is are they getting enough milk? And that's a question most of us parents um, and, and, and everybody wants to kind of ensure what's going on. Um, now, in terms of the, the getting enough milk, what you want to be looking at is that kind of suck and swallow pattern, okay? Essentially, a baby is consuming enough milk if they are, you know, if you can hear that swallow pattern and that's quite quick during the initial part of breastfeeding and then they tend to slow down. So the swallowing is this kind of soft, airy, actual gulp sound that you can hear for the baby. Um, and if a baby is not getting enough milk, you know, what you would notice is that kind of silent sucking at the breast. And that's, if, you're, if you notice that and you're concerned about it, again, that's something to come in and have a chat with us, have a chat with your obstetrician, your pediatrician, um, you know, your uh, postpartum professionals, professionals that are helping you out, lactation consultants and midwives as well, and really assessing whether there's a low milk production problem there at all. Now, it can get quite confusing with babies, whether they just want to drink and they just want to be at the breast to continue feeding, or whether they just, you know, want to be held by yourself. A lot of us will find you, you have a baby who does really good swallows, slows down, and then just, you know, you think they're asleep, you put them down the bassinet and they wake up, okay? That's absolutely normal. Babies love to be held, they love to be held by their, by their mother, okay? It's a biologically appropriate need for all babies. So this is where, you know, you can get your village to help you out, essentially, okay? If a baby, you know, breastfeeding is, is an exhausting, process, especially after giving birth. So having people to help support you, carry your baby around, keep them close is, is very, very useful. Now, if they're perfectly content in your arms, you don't want to put them down, you're happy holding them, that's absolutely fine too. And again, the last thing is, you know, this kind of timing of breastfeeding. And I, that's one of the questions I get a lot uh, from, from patients, from friends, family members. Basic line is you don't really need to be timing breastfeeding. You don't need to have a baby on the breast for 15 minutes or 20 minutes and you will not move them beforehand. That you don't need to do that at all. Some mums may have enough milk or sometimes even too much milk that the baby drinks, has a good swallow, has a good sucking swallow pattern, you know, is content at the breast um, and then they fall asleep at the breast or even if they don't fall asleep, they're not showing any of the hunger cues. If their weight is going up well, they're, you know, Peas and poos are doing well. Um, overall, they look satisfied after a breastfeeding session. You don't even need to move them to the other breast if, if, if you don't have to. And if they're content, you could just leave them be. The other thing is, you know, in terms of timing breastfeeding for some women who are struggling with that milk supply, especially the initial few days, a couple of weeks, it can be really exhausting to have a baby and time that baby at the breast for, you know, like they have to be there for 15, 20 minutes. It gets exhausting for the mum, it gets exhausting for the baby. So, Actually, when you notice that swallow pattern is slowing down, the best thing is just then just to move them to the other side rather than saying, you know, you have to be there for a certain amount of time. Um, just continuing on, so I know we touched a little bit about weight loss and gaining weight. So um, for exclusively fed, breastfed babies, it is absolutely normal for them to lose nearly 7 to 10% of their birth weight typically happens by day five. 
And most of these babies, as long as mom's milk supply is coming in well, babies are feet, you know, they've got a good kind of latch, they're extracting the milk out well, they're peeing enough, they're stooling enough and appropriately for their age, they tend to gain that weight back by two weeks, as long as mom's producing enough milk and they're getting that milk. Um, and then typically after a two-week period, it's about you know, 20 to 30 grams per day until at least they reach three months, okay? But weight loss is, um, you know, it, if you're noticing that your baby's losing a lot of weight, um, you're struggling with milk supply or you're struggling with latch um, or they're not able to extract enough milk, these are the times when you need to come in and have a chat, okay? Um, and if, if that's been a bit of a struggle, you know, maybe baby is not able to, you, mom's got lots of milk, but baby's not able to extract it, that's when sort of things about like supplementation comes in, okay? We want to think about early supplementation as we of course don't want the baby to be hungry. And you can supplement with lots of things, your own express milk, especially if mom has lots of milk, but baby's just not able to latch or extract that milk. Or if mom is struggling with milk supply, baby has a good latch, everything's working well, then supplementing that with, uh, you know, donor milk, and if required, formula milk as well. Um, so again, it's just um, kind of, seeing what who might be at risk of low milk supply and really assessing that as well. Um, so typically, if first-time moms tend to have a little bit of delay in milk coming in, um, or if you've had any challenges with breastfeeding before. Um, other potential um, uh, sort of medical conditions that could put you at risk of low milk supply is, you know, um, obesity is one of them, diabetes, any history of sort of fertility concerns, being treated for fertility treatments and things that can potentially put you at a risk of low milk supply. So again, it's just making sure, you know, we're getting, you're getting the right help and you're, if you need to supplement, you're supplementing for the right reasons. Um, and I think Kristen will maybe link it to at the end of the presentation, but, you know, when we talk about donor milk, donor milk is available in Singapore. Um, we, there's uh, two groups you can, uh, you can um, reach out to. There's the KK Women's and Children's Hospital that has a milk bank. Um, and also there's a more of an informal group, I think it's a Facebook group as well, that tends to have um, donor moms giving out donor milk as well. So um, I'm sure this will post that link later. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about the next few things. So triple feeding, a lot of moms um, may be discharged from hospital or maybe have seen a lactation consultant and then they're told to do this triple feeding, which is basically you get the baby on the breast, you feed them for a while, then you pump or you express milk, and then you give baby that express milk or a little bit of supplement from donor milk or formula milk. Triple feeding is great and it can help build up the supply, but it's just a really exhausting process and it should not be done for weeks on end. So if you're on this triple feeding regime, you don't know what to do, it pretty much should be reviewed in a few days time since when you started it, and most definitely it's not a long-term thing. So again, something to watch out for. Now, short feeds sort of ties in with the timing that we talked about. So really essentially short feeds are okay um, as long as baby looks, you know, has that suck, swallow, slow down pattern, content at the breast, they're sort of, um, you know, gaining weight well, urinating and stooling appropriately. If the baby has a short feed and they're sort of, is that silent sucking, um, or they're just looking really strong, or they just fall asleep at the breast by trying to suck but no swallow, then again, that's a concern for maybe no milk supply, and again, something for you to be assessed together with your baby as well. Now, cluster feeding, I think, is something which a lot of moms, especially if you've gone to breastfeeding, tend to um, really fear. It is pretty much, it feels like you're breastfeeding continuously, okay, and baby just wants to nurse often. Sometimes, Moms who've been breastfeeding well before, and when baby starts cluster feeding, they get concerned about whether this is, does this mean I have low supply? So the way to look at it is if they're cluster feeding, so that means they're just on off, on off the breast a lot, but you know, you've had normal cluster, so cluster development, you had normal milk supply in the initial few weeks, nothing major has happened since then. Um, baby is gaining weight, baby again is peeing, pooing appropriately, which means they're adequately hydrated. That then means the cluster feeding is just to drive up your supply to match the baby's needs, and that's actually fine. But if the baby is really frantic, really frustrated at the breast, trying to cluster feed, just not content after any breastfeeding at all, then again, that's a sign to get help. So essentially, if you're having any problem, the, the basic one of the slides is just reach out to somebody for help, okay? Um, 
apart from sort of weight and weight loss and uh, you know milk supply and things, some other problems that a lot of women do experience, um, you know, is nipple pain, breast pain. That's really really common. Nipple pain can happen for multiple reasons in um, while you're breastfeeding, and similarly together with breast pain as well. You know, the breast in itself is such a is this is essentially a gland, okay, like your thyroid gland, like your menopause gland. It's got so much blood supply, so much nerve supply. So as nipples and breast develop and grow during pregnancy, shapes change, things change, that kind of pain sensation changes as well. Now, nipple pain, especially if you've got persistent nipple pain, you really need to be speaking to somebody, you really need that assessed. It can happen for many reasons. It can happen to mums with low milk supply. It can happen to mums with a really high milk supply. Um, if you've got a really fast let down, you may have a baby that's just not able to drink all that milk. So the baby might be clumping down on the nipple to slow the milk flow down as well. So again, that's just something that needs to be looked at. Some, some women may experience a bit of skin inflammation around the nipple. Um, you know, certain creams, I, I know a lot of the times we, um, you know, lanolin creams out there a lot, but a lot of women can get high sensitivity to it as well. So, um, so, you know, so again, it's just something we need to be looking at. Um, and finally, um, again, blood supply to the nipple can also change. So again, that can cause nipple pain as well. Breast pain in the early days, you know, there's engorgement, there's plugging, um, and the redness of breast, which sometimes gets confused for mastitis, which is an infection of the breast, um, but there can be so much going on with the breast. And essentially, the main thing I really want you to take away from this is that you will, a lot of women will get engorgement. If that happens, simple techniques is good, you know, a bit of warm, sort of warm compression, a bit of ice packs, simple paracetamol, simple ibuprofen, as long as you have no drug allergies or other medical conditions are useful. Make sure you do not massage the breast, okay? Do not do the deep massaging, which really hurts your breast glandular tissue, causes a lot of inflammation and sometimes can make the problem worse. So I know here in Singapore, we're very lucky. We have a lot of postnatal massage ladies that can come, but when they do that deep massage to the breast, it can be really, really detrimental. So avoid doing that. A light massage, like a lymphatic drainage, which I haven't got it on the slide actually, but we can email it out to you guys if you'd like. It's just a very simple lymphatic massage to get the fluid around the breast. Wound. Essentially, the reason engorgement and plugging happens is if you can imagine, you know, you've got your breast gland, which has got blood supply, you've got little sacs of sort of uh, milk coming in, um, fluid around, around the organ in itself. So it's just a lot of swelling, essentially, that's what it is. And even plugging, that plug that you feel is swelling. So it does not need to be squeezed out, okay? So please avoid doing that at all costs, okay? It is very simple management, you know, making sure your breasts are well supported. It's like what you would do for an ankle sprain, okay? If you've got a swollen ankle, you would rest it, you would ice it, you take some painkillers, take some anti-inflammatories to make it better never in your mind would you be squeezing the inflammation out of your ankle swelling. So that's essentially the principle around breast engorgement plugging into the cell. Mastitis, I think, is maybe too often diagnosed and a lot of mums don't even need antibiotics and can be managed by very simple techniques. So again, if you're in this arena of getting all these problems, please come and speak to somebody, come and speak to us and we can definitely help you out, okay, without the need even for medications. But if sometimes it is an infection of the breast, you need antibiotics, that's absolutely fine too. Most antibiotics, most medications are fine to take during pregnant and during breastfeeding. Um, you can still continue to breastfeed from the breast that's infected, and that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, the one thing I've not mentioned here is like a bit of a lopsided breast. And again, that plays into this mastitis engorgement problem as well. Um, some women may have engorgement on one breast and not the other. And they're, you know, misadvised to continue pumping that big engorged breast or continue feeding the baby on that breast. But actually, if you think about it, it's making the, the, the whole problem worse. You know, breast milk production is all about this reflex that goes from the breast to the brain and this inhibitory reflex. So if one breast is getting a lot of attention, that tells the brain to make more milk for that breast. So you're making that engorgement, you know, um, lopsided problem even worse. So typically for that, what we recommend is feed the baby on the softer breast first. Um, and, you know, if they're still needed, then get them onto the, the, the more heavily engorged breast. Um, you do not need to pump till you're empty. 
if you're really, really uncomfortable, you can express a bit of milk to keep yourself comfortable, but definitely do not go down this rabbit hole of trying to keep your breasts empty because that just makes your production even higher. Okay, so um, that's one of the mismatches. So again, lots of things, very difficult to talk about in a quick presentation, but please do reach out if you need help. Now, breastfeeding concerns can also be because of infant related problems, because of baby related problems. Okay, so jaundice is, um, is a big one, and especially living in Singapore, a lot of us with sort of Asian genes, we do have a higher risk factor of having babies with um, jaundice. Essentially, it's because they have too much of this um, element called bilirubin in their blood, which tends to um, cause this kind of yellow discoloration. Jaundice does not mean that you have to stop breastfeeding or you have to supplement. It is all about, you know, looking at the baby in whole, looking at how the breastfeeding is working out, looking at how well hydrated the baby is, and seeing what options are there. So again, it's something that reach out to a doctor and speak to them about. Um, you know, babies crying while feeding, again, could be two, can be two different sides of the spectrum. So maybe because of really low milk supply, maybe getting frustrated or really overproduction of milk. Maybe it's just not able to, you know, it's too much milk coming in their mouth or so that overflow. So again, happen to, um, if that's what you're noticing, talking to somebody and getting that assessed with somebody. Now, the next two things, the sleeping and the colic. Okay, those are a bit later, not quite a, in the early weeks. So if you're lucky, your baby may start sleeping of you know good five hour stretches from sort of six weekish onwards. Not all babies will do that, but some do. If your baby's doing that um, and you know they're gaining weight well, again hydrated well, so peas and poos are good. Um, they're content with their breastfeeding. You don't particularly need to wake them up at night to give them a feed, and you yourself don't need to wake up to be pumping um, to keep up the milk supply. Essentially, you want to be matching your baby, but if you have a baby who's been struggling with weight gain, if you've been struggling with low milk supply, then yes, that's when it comes into whether we want to consider waking baby up if they're, if they're sleeping through, or if not waking baby up, then you, know, wake, you, know, you might have to stimulate nipple and breast stimulation at night to make sure your um, milk supply continues to stay up. But again, this is something we need to talk about. Now, colic um, is a really important period of brain development in most babies, okay? It tends to happen in that four to six week period. It's that period of purple crying, you know, this evening cluster feeding. And even during that evening time cluster feeding, baby's just not satisfied with the breast. They're trying to find comfort, but they're just not satisfied. So if that's going on, and again, baby's gaining weight well, peeing well, pooing well, content to the breast at most other times, this might be a time when you can even think about introducing a pacifier if breastfeeding relationship has been set up well, getting your partner, if you've got family around, or if you've got some live-in help or even part-time help to come and help you with the baby for you to get a break too. Take them out. Fresh air does it are all wonders and it helps babies as well. Um, so just, uh, you know, trying, trying that. Okay. Um, and I think just, just a last slide really on this. So, um, early postpartum is really, really difficult. It's just whirlwind of physical, emotional, mental difficulties. You know, you're exhausted, abdominal muscles are all over the place, there's so much weakness, bowel movement all over the place, you feel a bit constipated. Many women are really afraid to even have that first bowel movement. Um, you know, there's pelvic pain, pain in your sutures, pelvic pore disorders, there's literally so much going on. Um, so, with all of this, I think you know, the threshold for any kind of, if you want to reach out for help is very, very low. So please do make use of all the services that are available in Singapore um, and lots and lots of good people are out there to be able to help you out. Um, and of course, nothing tops your mental health. So again, if you're having difficulty, um, if, you're, if you're just feeling quite overwhelmed, come and speak to somebody. It may not be, breastfeeding may not be the one to blame, but there are lots of things we can do to help support you, help support your breastfeeding journey, um, and just kind of look after yourself and your baby. All right, thank you guys. Um, so just a quick summary, um, we just talked about a fantastic breastfeeding guest. Um, and the key thing in that breastfeeding journey is literally all about the support you can get from as early as possible and continuing that support. Thank you guys. Great, thank you, Dr. Trisha, for this great overview on breastfeeding.
Breastfeeding can be such a beautiful and special experience, but just because it's natural doesn't mean it comes naturally. It can also be incredibly challenging and isolating. And that's why it's so important to seek out support if you need it, as Dr. Tricia said. We've had some questions come in already, but as a reminder, if you would um, have something you would like to ask, please put it in the Zoom chat function and we will we'll do our best to get to all the questions. Uh, the first question that we have is, is the benefits the same for moms who direct latch with a pumping ones? Uh, or are both considered breastfeeding? Yeah, so, I mean, breastfeeding, um, of course, breastfeeding is breastfeeding, okay? Whether you're expressing milk, you're providing great, fantastic nutrition to your child. Whether you're direct latching, you're providing great, fantastic nutrition to your child as well. Um, in terms of the medical benefits, of course, it doesn't change um, whether you're directly latching or whether you're expressing milk, okay? The only thing, I guess, um, is sometimes... You know, there's a theory behind this that if you're directly latching, then, you know, there's like a communication between the infant's sort of, you know, bacteria and all of that together with the mum's uh, receptors at the breast. So it's kind of this two-way communication. Of course, if you're exclusively expressing milk, so if you're just pumping, that kind of um, communication may not be there. Does it have such a big impact in terms of the goodness that your baby is getting? Probably not. Um, it's just still area of research. Um, but yes, overall, in terms of benefit, it, it's both pretty much. It's both very, very beneficial. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, the second question we have is kind of around postnatal massages. Um, including the lactation massage. Would you recommend it at all? Or are there simple techniques or gentle massages uh, that masseuses can do? And what about lymphatic drainage massages? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a really tricky one because I think it depends on who your massage provider person is. Um, you know, there is so much misconception around breastfeeding. Unfortunately, you know, there's so much old wives' tales about it, right? So it's really, really hard to say whether a prenatal breast massage is good or not. To be honest, it's kind of like, you know, if, if a guy, if a man has an inflamed prostate, we're not gonna be going up their bum and you know, massaging that out. So it's something very similar. Um, a light massage, a lymphatic drain, which is literally a light touch. It's literally like petting a cat. It's just circular, very light movements. But if you're going anything deeper, that does tend to damage breast tissue. And in the recent world of breastfeeding medicine, it really is a big no-no. So we do not quite recommend a deep massage for breast at all. Okay, um, I, have a, I have a series of questions coming in. A lot of people are interested about a specific topic and it's whether or not any food should be avoided when breastfeeding. And a second follow-up to, to that is, how long after drinking a glass of wine can I nurse? And I feel you mamas on that one. Yes, exactly. I know that wine question is so, so important. Um, our savior, right? Um, so foods, um, first of all, um, the, it's a complicated answer, but the simple answer for most women is no, you do not need to avoid any foods at all while you're breastfeeding. Um, you know, culturally, um, you know, you're told, oh, you can't eat spicy food or you can't eat X, Y, Z, or you can't do this or a baby's gassy it's because of you know the chilies you had last night that's not quite true babies will be gassy okay babies guts are developing and they're going to be gassy and gassiness is sometimes very good for babies because it tells us the guts are, are developing the microbiome is developing okay in some circumstances we may recommend some moms to cut out certain foods from their diet but again, this is very much dependent on a full thorough assessment of mom, of baby, of what's going on. For example, if your baby has been doing well, they're you know, two months old and suddenly you start noticing blood in their stools, okay? There can be many different reasons for why you've got blood, but sometimes typically, especially if they're an exclusively breastfed baby, that might be to do with certain proteins in the breast milk. And again, then we look at that whole picture and decide whether that's even something we want to consider, okay? Sometimes blood in stools can be because of really high supply of milk, okay? We don't know exactly what's the scientific reason behind this, but mums, especially, and we've noticed, you know, 
Um, moms who tend to donate to donor milk uh, banks, right? They, they usually tend to have over milk supply. They donate some of their milk and babies who tend to drink that milk tend to have a bit more of a mucusy stool, sometimes a bit blood in stools. And that's possibly one of the reasons. So I think you don't need to avoid anything as long as you're okay and baby's okay. You don't need to do that at all. Um, if baby's very, very gassy, you're really, really concerned, please speak to somebody, uh, sort of a professional before you even decide to start cutting out foods. Um, and yes, alcohol. So ideally, of course, you, you know, it's a, it's a tricky one. Ideally, you shouldn't drink alcohol, okay, while you're breastfeeding. But we know that can sometimes be quite unrealistic. Um, so if you're having a drink, you don't particularly need to wait or time your drink. Um, and this whole thing of pumping and dumping the milk, so don't do that either. Um, pretty much what your baby is getting in terms of that, you know, alcohol concentration, it's kind of what your blood alcohol concentration is at that time. For example, if you drink orange juice, you know, there is some alcohol in there too. So that kind of that ethanol is there. So that blood concentration is there. So if you're limiting yourself to one or two glasses of wine a day, that's probably okay. If you're having a, you know, a massive night out, which I doubt you will with a new baby. So um, probably, you know, avoid drinking um, more than a glass or two of wine a, a day um, and kind of really taking it from there. But I would not pump and dump the milk in any way. Don't be really need to time your breast milk feeding if you're drinking, um, drinking a bit of alcohol. That's actually fine too. But ideally, of course, the best is not to drink if you can. <laughs> Great. Super helpful advice. Uh, we've had also a lot of questions come in around the concept of nipple confusion. So the idea that introducing a pacifier or bottle will make breastfeeding harder. Um, can you elaborate on that? And one of the specific yeah. examples someone wrote was, um, I was hoping that they could breastfeed the bottle or breastfeed from a bottle during the night so that the husband could like help out while we got more sleep, you know, yeah. but would that cause nipple confusion? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's definitely two parts to that as well. Um, so, you know, if breastfeeding is going well and you, you know, you're getting enough milk, baby's getting enough milk, baby's settled, in those initial few weeks, I would say at least four to six weeks, try not to drink, introduce any other nipples, okay? No bottle, no pacifiers, if possible, okay? Once that breastfeeding relationship is set up well, then you can definitely introduce bottles, you can definitely introduce pacifiers as well. For some mums who are struggling with low milk supply, there's different ways of how you can supplement that milk. Okay, so of course we talk about the different types of milk that you can supplement with, but also how you can give it can be in many different ways. A lot of the ways are a bit finicky, they can get a little bit annoying and quite fiddly to do. So if you do go down the route of using bottles to give express milk or you know, donor milk or formula milk, the way to try and keep it as similar to as uh, sort of the breast nipple is kind of using the technique of um, sort of paste feeding which is basically, you know, uh, when you buy bottles um, so you sort of for mother care, wherever, they will tell you, oh, you have to push the bottle down like that, make sure the nipple is completely full so the baby gets a nipple, and then you have to change the nipple size as the baby gets older. But actually, again, that's a big no-no. Don't do that at all. Um, if you want to continue a good breastfeeding relationship, you want the bottle nipple to do what the breast nipple does, okay? Breast nipple does usually does not force or gush down a lot of milk with, baby, with lack of baby's effort. So that's what you want the bottle to do. So paste feeding is a technique we do recommend to moms who are using um, supplementation. And what that does is essentially, you know, giving the milk a little by little and making sure the baby's, you, you know, having that effort even at the bottle to extract the milk. And again, using the bottle nipples, you can be size zero, zero or preemie sizes. And that's actually fine to continue on for the longest of times. You do not need to change that at all, okay? Because your nipples don't change, right? Your, the, the, how much milk comes out doesn't change on that. So that's one of the things to think about, um, especially if you're doing early supplementation. Um, sorry, Kristen, there was one more. Wasn't there another question on that? Or, I think you've kind that? of covered both of covered them. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Nipple confusion was a hot topic when I was in those early but, days. Mean, yeah, but I mean, to be honest, um, you know, it depends on what you want to do. So I think the, the, the one thing I did want to comment on is somebody who said, you know, my partner can feed at night while I sleep. Again, that can be a little bit detrimental to the whole breastfeeding relationship, okay? 
Reason being is because nighttime, that early morning, early sort of late nighttime period is where you really need that nipple and breast stimulation to keep that milk supply going. So if you're asleep for six, eight hours when your baby is awake, that then tells your breast to make less milk. And then you start in that struggle of making enough milk. What I tend to find, and again, this is very much a personal conversation we like to have with our patients, with the women we see, is it depends on how comfortable you are, okay? Do you prefer the option of, you know, babies up at night, they want to feed, you feed them and literally hand them over to your partner, night nanny, confinement nanny, family member, anybody who then looks after their diaper changing, rocking them to sleep, doing whatever, whatever needs to be done. Or do you prefer actually waking up at night, expressing by using a pump um, and then your partner or anybody else using that pumped express milk to be given to the baby later? Everyone's different. Um, you know, it, it depends on what you would prefer. I do find using a pump at night can be really, really annoying. Um, so I always find just having the baby breastfeed, even if in that side lying position and literally your partner or somebody takes the baby and does everything else with them. And you tend to get a good amount of breast in that way, okay? So cutting out a complete, cutting out night feedings completely is going to be detrimental for breast milk production. And you know, if you're, Unfortunately, with breastfeeding, baby is attached to you, okay? It is just one of those things. It does get better with time, but in that initial few weeks, it is as annoying as it is, and as good as it is, they are just somewhat attached to you. Great. Yeah. Uh, the next question is definitely a sign of the times, and we have an article on this, and I'll send it out, but are there guidelines around breastfeeding, pumping, if you are COVID positive? I'm sorry, are there guidelines around? Yeah, uh, guidelines or um, about breastfeeding or pumping if you are COVID positive. Yeah, um, so there are a few guidelines. I think the American Academy of Pediatrics has a couple of guidelines. Um, there are a few guidelines I can uh, sort of send to Kristen and she can email you guys out. But essentially, if you are COVID positive, it's actually fine. So continue breastfeeding, continue pumping, whatever you need to do. Your baby is getting really good antibodies. If you're if you're if you're COVID positive, if you're doing a direct latching while you're acutely COVID positive, again you can continue to do that, but of course taking safety measures. So you know wearing a mask around your baby, washing your hands, you know making sure your baby is sort of you know that infection risk is as low as possible. Okay, so you can directly latch, you can continue to pump even if you're COVID positive. Okay, great. Um, I, we've had uh, so many questions come through and sadly we don't have enough time to get through all of them. So I am just recording the last few, um, but we will send them all to Dr. Trisha. She will hopefully answer them for us. And in the follow-up email that you should get from me in um, either Friday or Monday, you'll get all the answers um, there. And we'll also share some additional articles um, to expand on some of those. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Trisha and Osler Health International. And to all of you today for joining our Sassy Mama expert chat, we hope you learned something um, useful information to help support you in your breastfeeding journey. Uh, to get more tips and information, follow Osler Health International on their Instagram. And again, as I said, look out for a follow-up email with a link to watch uh, to rewatch today's present presentation, as well as an opportunity to provide feedback on today's event. And stay tuned for our upcoming Sassy Mama events. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.